many of you have ever read your Bible? Every trial, even if I just open up to Genesis chapter 1, in the beginning, ever tried to read the Bible? All of us as, as Christians have opened the Bible. Even if we didn't know where to begin, we started somewhere. For some of us, we just threw it open and said, wherever it lands, that's where I'm going to read. For others of us, we've said, God, what do you want me to read? I'm not very sure, but I'm going to try, John. Some of us have taken instruction, and somebody said, whenever you don't know where to read, start with the Gospel of John, John chapter 1. We all have a method to how we read the Bible. But too often when we read the Bible, the Bible is staring back at us. So we're looking at the words in the book, but we're not able to comprehend what it is that we're reading. How many of you have been there? We're reading the scripture because we want to be dutiful. We want to be Christians, but we can't rightly say that we understand everything that we're reading. We can't with confidence say, I know what God is saying to me after I have read Ezekiel chapter 22, because that's where my Bible flipped over to. I can't rightly say I completely understand how this is applicable to my life. I can't rightly understand how I'm supposed to be changed by my reading Zephaniah. I don't understand how each of these books are supposed to make a difference in my life, because the Bible is here for the Christian, and I am a Christian, and even though I'm reading this book, I cannot process what is this book saying to me. The Bible is a difficult book. It's difficult only because it is spiritually discerned. Say spiritually discerned. The Bible is spiritually discerned. In other words, the Bible requires illumination. It requires illumination. There are various types of lighting. There is a kind of light that is specific to a task. If I want details done, I need to turn on or have a light bulb that is specific. It's a bright light. And then there's a kind of lighting that's ambient. In other words, when I'm ready to go and take a picture, I don't need that bright, stark light because that bright light will show every pimple, every mark, every dimple. It will show every wrinkle that's on your face. I don't want that kind of lighting when I'm taking a picture. I want that kind of lighting when I'm sitting at the restaurant. But there's another kind of lighting that the restaurant uses. It's ambient. Sometimes it's so low that you can't even identify what you've ordered. And so you want to tell them, can you turn up the lights in here so that I can see what it is I've ordered. It's called illumination. The more light I have, the clearer it is. The more light I have, I can see. If I read in my Bible and I cannot see how this is applicable to my life, I need illumination. I need illumination. The Bible is the only book where I can open the book and the author will tell me, will teach me, will guide me, will instruct me and lead me to what it is that God is trying to tell me. The Bible has been given to the believer. And as believers, we believe in the triune God. God the Father, come on, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit's job is to illuminate. His job is to give meaning to God's word for us individually. His job is to bring meaning and show us how it is applicable to our lives. Jesus said, I am going away to my Father, but I am sending to you the Comforter. The scripture says in John 14, 26, he is the counselor whom the father will send in my name and he will teach you all things. Say so you don't understand the Holy Spirit is designed to teach us all things. Moreover, he will remind us what Jesus said. John 14, 17 says the Holy Spirit, he will lead you into truth. You're off in a fallacy, off in error. He will lead you into truth. 
John 16, 15, the spirit will take from what is mine, Jesus talking, and he will make it known to you. The Bible is not designed to be a mystery to you. It's designed for you to know the truth. Paul said, I ask the Father and God of our Lord Jesus Christ to give you his spirit. The spirit will make you wise. I said the spirit will make you wise and let you understand what it means to know God. So when I read my Bible, I need to begin by asking God for illumination. Holy Spirit, you are welcome here to show me what God is saying, to help me understand how is this word applicable for my life. Paul continues in Ephesians 1, 18 and 19. He says that the eyes of our understanding would be enlightened. So we know the hope of our calling, the riches of the glory of his inheritance, and the exceeding greatness of his power towards us who believes. The word enlightened in that scripture is a word meaning photizo. Say photizo. Photizo means to shine light on something. It means it's an aha moment that while you may have read the Lord is my shepherd on Monday, when there's photizo in place, you got a revelation that God is not just a shepherd on a piece of paper. No, the Lord is my shepherd and I shall not, no matter where I go, the Lord is shepherding over my life. I've got a revelation. I've been illuminated to the truth of God's word. In other words, I've got it. I've got an aha moment. I understand illumination. It makes dark eyes see. I once was blind, but now I see. What happens when God opens my eyes? Now, this is a teaching ministry, so I encourage you to write your notes. Because when you leave this place, you'll forget, and we don't want you to forget. We want you to always be able to apply the word so you can see a difference in your life, not just on Sunday when it's a high praise and everybody's happy, but on Wednesday when the attack comes, on Thursday when you're not sure which way to go, on Friday when everything just seems platonic. We want you to be able to apply the word of God. So what happens when God opens my eyes. First thing that happens, I see the solution to my problem. I see the solution to my problem. The Bible talks about a story in Genesis chapter 21. We're going to begin reading at 14, but let me, let me set up the story. God gave Abraham a promise. How many know that God cannot lie? He cannot lie and he will not lie. He's not a man that he would lie. So God told Abraham, I'm going to give you a son. Year after year, no son was produced. He's up to 90 years old and still there is no child. Is God a liar? God is not a liar. So Abraham is here struck by, I still have no son, yet you made me a promise. Either I'm going to believe or I'm not going to believe. We too have that same decision. Regardless of how long it takes, am I going to believe or am I not going to believe? Abraham said, I'm going to believe you, my God. Sarah said, well, let's help God out and let's go ahead and use my maidservant, Hagar. Hagar is young. She's viable. She's able to have a baby. Let's have a baby through her surrogacy. We've heard of that. So Abraham said, sounds like a plan, let's do that. So they have a baby through Hagar. God intervenes and he said, I never told you to do that. I didn't tell you I needed your help. This is what I told you. Now, I'm not telling you the story line by line. I have to, uh, what's the word I want? I'm paraphrasing. So this is just me, y'all. Now, you got to go read your Bible to see exactly how he said verse by verse. I'm paraphrasing to make it quick. He says, sounds like a plan, let's have a baby. So they have this baby together because God said, that's not how I want you to have this baby. I never told you to go lay with Hagar. I told you I'm going to give you a seed and I'm going to give it to you through Sarah. But you don't understand. No, they didn't say any of that. But you don't understand. No, we don't know how. No, none of that came to pass. They chose to believe God. And so it was that Sarah gave birth to a child. 
The child's name was Isaac. And when the child was born, the same mama, Sarah, who said, go and lay with Hagar and have this child, Ishmael. Ishmael is the father of the nations of all Arabs or Arabic nations. He's the father of all of those nations. When God brings to Sarah a child, Sarah looks over at Hagar's son, who's a little older, and sees him making mockery. She is threatened by his behavior because now he looks like he's going to be the heir. But she doesn't want that because she wants her son, Isaac, to be the heir. So can you see the contradiction? First she said, going to have one now that he's here. Uh-uh, you got to get rid of him. This is all your fault. If you had done this thing right, come on, ladies, you understand. It's all your fault. This is not my fault. So now you got to do something about this problem. Send her away. And so we pick it up here at verse 14. Early the next morning, Abraham took some food and a skin of water and gave them to Hagar. He, sent, he set them on her shoulders and then sent her off with the boy. She went on her way and wandered in the desert of Beersheba. When the water in the skin was gone, say the water was gone. She put the boy under one of the bushes. I cannot watch the boy die. And as she sat there nearby, she began to sob. She had a problem, y'all. Can you hear the problem? She's out in the desert. She's not in a little city where there's seasonals. No, she's in the desert with no water. She says, uh, I, she began to cry, and God heard the boy crying. And the angel of God called to Hagar from heaven and said to her, what is the matter, Hagar? Do not be afraid. What is the matter? What is the matter? If I could call your name, I would call your name. What is the matter, Sue? What is the matter, John? What is the matter, Matt? What is the matter, Jacob? What is the matter? God has heard the boy crying as he lies there. Lift up the boy and take him by the hand, for I will make him a great nation. Did it seem impossible? Yes, it seemed impossible. They're there in the middle of a desert with no water, but God said it is possible because I will make him into a great nation. Verse 19, then God opened her eyes and she saw a well of water. So she went and filled the skin with water and gave the boy a drink. What happens when God opens my eyes? He gives me a solution to my problem. Here Hagar was in the middle of a desert with no water and no, no, no remedy. Which way are we going to turn? Yet God intervened for her. She didn't even come to him first. He came to her, said, what is the matter? Look and see this water. This wasn't a mirage in the desert. She was able to go and get some water and give it to her son. Your problem, your issue, whatever's bothering you, the answer is right in front of you. Why? Because the God we serve is faithful. He will never let you in the desert and not provide strength in your valley, a river in your desert. He always said, I will provide for you. Your answer is right in front of you. You need illumination. Your answer is there. A woman came to the altar and she needed prayer. I have migraine headaches. I don't know how to get rid of them. I've been to die. I don't know what to do. She said, I can't produce because I'm always plagued by these headaches. Illumination changed and made all the difference. We prayed for her, and it was there that God spoke and said, you're not drinking enough water. Water, something she sees every day. Water coming out of the spigot. Water coming out of the tank. Water, something simple and easy. Your answer is right in front of you. What happens when God opens my eyes? Number one. I see the solution to my problem. Number two, I see the barrier to my progress. Come on, say, I see the barrier to my progress. You see, Balaam is a man in the Old Testament. He was a prophet. And as a prophet, 
God is the one who speaks to him, and he is supposed to say only what he hears God say. He's not supposed to add to it or take away from it. Well, let me set up the story for us. We have Balaam, who is a prophet, and we have a man named Barak. Barak is the king of another army, and Israel is moving towards their promised land. And as they move, they're coming big and strong. The reputation of them is going before them. So when Barak hears, am I saying Barak right? When Barak hears that Israel is coming, he gets intimidated. Why? Because they're getting ready to suck up all of his land. They're getting ready to take over. Well, I mean, you know, if somebody's coming to take over, you get defensive. Wait a minute. You can't take over my land. This is what I have. And I heard you've been taking everybody else's land, but you're not going to take my land. So he has to come up with a plan. So he decides, I'm going to go to this prophet named Balaam. He goes to the prophet Balaam through his servants. He said, you tell uh, Balaam to come on over here and prophesy. I want you to curse Israel. I want you to curse them so that they will not come in and take my property. And so Balaam says, all right, well, let me go seek the face of God so I can know what to do. So that night he seeks God's face and God says, do not, do not, do not. Curse that people. That people is a blessed people. That people, they belong to me. Come on, say, I belong to God. That people you may not curse. And because you may not curse, I do not expect you to go up with them to go curse these people. Balaam says, okay, and he tells the servants of Barak, I'm sorry, sir, I cannot go with you because God told me that if I go with that, those people that you want me to curse, those people are blessed, so I can't touch them. So Barak, he sends word and he says, you don't understand. These people are getting ready to take all my property. I told you I'll pay you. If I told you I'll pay you, come on, let me pay you. I'll pay you good. I'll take care of you. You come on and curse the people for me. Balaam, temptation, y'all, says, well, let me go seek God's face again. So then he needs a second answer. Now, when you heard God the first time, you don't need to hear a second time. But Balaam said, let me go seek again. So Balaam goes back to God and says, hey, God, he said he's going to pay me more. So if he's going to pay me more, can I go this time? And so God said, well, go. Go on then. You want to go? Go. 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 And many times that's what we do. We ask and harass, and then we get our answer. We get our feelings hurt. We try to, what happened? He told you no the first time. He told Barak, do not go. Barak went on up there, and the Bible says, turning your Bibles to Numbers 22. Numbers 22 is on your screen if you don't have your Bibles. Numbers 22, verse 22. But God was furious that Balaam was going. So he sent the angel of the Lord to stand in the road to block his way. He sent the angel of the Lord to stand in the road to block his way. Balaam's donkey suddenly saw the angel of the Lord standing in the road with a drawn sword in his hand. Who saw the angel? The donkey saw the angel. Did the man see the, the angel? No. And the donkey, because he saw the angel, bolted off the road into a field. But Balaam beat it. And turned it back on the road. Come on, I didn't tell you to go to the left. Go oh, get in place. Then the angel stood at a place where the road narrowed between two vineyard walls. When the donkey saw the angel, who saw the angel? The donkey saw the angel of the Lord standing there. It tried to squeeze by. It's trying to follow directions, so it's squeezing by, but it crushed Balaam's foot against the wall. What did Balaam do? He beat him. What you mean, crushing my foot? You told you to stay on the course. Then the angel of the Lord moved further down the road and stood in place so narrow that the donkey could not get by at all. This time when the donkey saw the angel, it just what? Lay down under Balaam. In a fit of rage, he was mad. Balaam beat it again with his staff. Verse 31 says, then the Lord, say the Lord, opened Balaam's eyes and he saw the angel of the Lord standing in the road with his sword drawn. So he bowed low and fell face down. Some of us have, some of us have dreams. We have vision. We got a place we want to go. And as much as we try to take a step, it looks like we're pushed back. Much as we want to go forward, it looks like we can't get there. No matter how hard we try, we just can't make any progress. We know what God wants. We know where we want to go. We got a plan, but somehow we are always stifled. Look like another hindrance, another obstacle. If it's not one thing, then it's another. But when we have illumination, 
when we can go into the word of God and see stories like Balaam, we can recognize we have one of two choices. We can stay right where we are and continue to beat our donkey. It's your fault. If you don't move, why don't you just move, then I can go forward. It's my mama's fault because she didn't tell me right. It's my job's fault because they didn't increase me like I was supposed to be. It's my husband's fault because he won't let me out of the house. It's my wife's fault because she always trying to make me accountable to stay in the house. We always beat our horse. We can stay in that state or we can decide, God, I need you to open my eyes and help me see what is the hindrance on the inside of me that's keeping me from making progression? What is it on the inside of me? Maybe I'm too mad too often. Maybe my attitude is keeping me from going forward. My mama always said, a bad attitude won't get you nowhere. I recognize it's a double negative, but she said it won't get you nowhere. Maybe it's because you choose to walk outside of love and God says, I'm calling you to another level. You will never go to the next level if you are not willing to be obedient to the living God. You will never see progress if you are unwilling to do it God's way. When he speaks, he expects an obedient people. When you are obedient and when you are willing, you will eat the good of the land. Stop standing there beating your donkey and get up and take account for who you are. What's going on on the inside of you? The person closest to you can tell you since you always complaining. No, nobody want to be around all of that. But because you're busy beating your donkey and blaming everybody else, you can't see it's on the inside of you. You got a narrow thinking. You can't see nothing. You always thinking about what happened yesterday. That's why you can't go forward for tomorrow. Somebody close to you can tell you what the issue is. I can guarantee you that. Hallelujah. Oh, glory to God. What happens when God opens my eyes? The first thing, I see the solution to my problem. The second thing, what? I see the barrier to my progress. God will open our eyes. The third thing, I see the defense for what's attacking me. I see the defense for what's attacking me. Listen, we all live a life where we will be or become under attack. We all will become under attack. We are not immune to attacks in life. But every one of us has an obligation to how we will respond to that attack. Each of us gets a choice to how we will respond to the attack. The attack is a presentation, but we can live into it or we can remove ourselves from it. The scripture tells us, turn your Bibles to 2 Kings chapter 6. I'm going to lay the foundation for us. The Bible talks about how Israel, as they were moving towards their promised land, how there was a, there was a city named Aram. Aram was always attacking Israel. They were always coming to defeat and hurt them. And maybe in your life you got somebody who's always trying to hurt you. They always got something negative to say about you. No matter which way you turn, yeah, that's not right. We turn that, I don't know why you're doing that. They always got something negative to say. You're under attack on your job. Everybody has isolated you and said, we don't want her to get the promotion. They've isolated you and your family. You're under attack. Maybe the attack is physical in your body. Once you get over one ailment, look like it's another one. Come to attack your body. You're under attack. And we all get a chance to choose how we will manage the fight. Here Aram was, and Aram was always attacking Israel. And Israel, they knew how to call on the name of the Lord. If nothing else, they knew how to call on the name of the Lord. You got to learn from the scriptures. Read your Bible and learn from by precept. Learn by example. Read your Bible so you can learn. If Israel can call on the name of God and they were not perfect people, I can call upon the name of God knowing that he is going to be my defense too. Scripture says in chapter 6, verse 10 of 2 Kings, this happened several times. Oh, I didn't tell the rest of the story. Every time Aaron was coming, God revealed to Israel what was going to happen. They're coming to the east, so you better get ready. So Israel's king would go and get ready. So as soon as Aaron got there, they were ready to fight, plumage. Say, so Aaron was in the, uh, the Arameans, Arameans, 
they were in there, uh, in, the king was in his home, and he would plan an attack on the south. And God would tell Israel, meet him on the south. Every time they would come against them, every time they would come against him, there Israel was waiting for him. And so here the scripture says, this happened several times, so the king of Aram became very upset over this. He called in his officers and demanded, which of you is the traitor? Who has been informing the king of Israel of my plans? It's not us, my lord. One of the officers replied, Elijah, the prophet of Israel, tells the king of Israel even the words you speak in the privacy of your bedroom. The king said, you go and find this Elisha and we'll send troops to seize him. The report came back, Elisha is at Dothan. So one night the king of Aram sent a great army with many chariots and horses to surround the city. When Elisha's servants got up, Elisha's servant was Gehazi. He got up that morning, went outside, and he saw troops of horses. He saw chariots everywhere. That's your enemy all around you. What will we do? He cried out to Elisha. Elisha said, do not be afraid. I'm here to tell you, do not be afraid. I don't care if it's the IRS coming to attack you. Do not be afraid. I don't care if it's the, the neighbor next door threatening you. Do not be afraid. I don't care if they're coming to take your children. Do not be afraid. You have to understand, just like Elisha told the servant Gehazi, the word is possible for you. Do not be afraid. Verse 17 says, then Elisha prayed, O Lord, open his eyes so he may see. Then the Lord opened the servant's eyes and he looked and saw the hills full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. You got to ask God, look and see that they that be for you are more than they that be against you. But the God that you serve has risen in his word that he's given his angels charge over you to keep you in all your ways so you don't dash your foot against a stone. You got to know that the word of God will not return void. He said that I am your shepherd, your defense and your shield. There is no weapon, no weapon, no weapon. Come on, say no weapon, no weapon that's formed against me that can prosper. Read your Bible. Read your Bible. Read your Bible. God has opened our eyes through his Bible. God has opened our eyes through his word. What happens when God opens my eyes? Illumination. Illumination. That when I may have been afraid, I don't have to be afraid because I have read that he is a shield all around me. I have read that he hides me in the secret place of his presence. From the plots of every man, he hides me in his pavilion from the strife of every tongue. Therefore, I don't have to walk like I'm intimidated, unsure if I'm welcome in the room. No, I recognize who I am in Christ Jesus. And there is no attack. There is no issue. There's nothing you can say that stops me from being who God called me to be. What happens when God opens my eyes? Number one, say it with me. I see the solution to my problem. Number two, I, say th I see the barrier to my progress. Number three, I see the defense for what's attacking me. Number four, I see how God is walking with me. I see how God is walking with me. Maybe you're feeling alone. Maybe you feel like God is distant. I need you to know that God is right where you are. He will never leave you nor forsake you. The scripture that we're going to look at is Luke chapter 24. Luke chapter 24 is telling us, or Luke chapter 24 is telling us about how Jesus, you remember how Jesus, he walked the earth 
freely, but when it was time, when it was his time, they came and they put thorns on his head. They came and they slapped him. They came and spat on him. Oh, they hurt our Jesus. Then they crucified him. They crucified him, put him up and crucified him, and then they brought him down and put him in a tomb. And then the Bible says that we call it Easter Sunday morning. Then we find out that the women who came to anoint the body went in to see the body to anoint it and found the body was gone. The body of Jesus was gone. Now you have to understand, this is a tumultuous time in the minds of people. First of all, the disciples have esteemed him as the Christ. They have made him the Messiah because he has shown them, he has proven himself. But the, in their mind, they said he was going to rule over all so that they would no longer be over Roman, be under Roman uh, Roman dictatorship, but they would, they would be free from anybody wanting them and telling them what to do and how to do it. So they thought this Jesus was going to stay with them forever, and they had it set up so that he would stay with them the way in the natural. God doesn't do everything the way we think he's going to do it. This Jesus that they espouse as their Messiah, he is now dead. He, they saw him crucified. They saw him put into this tomb, and now this Jesus is missing. You can understand their quandary. You can understand their fear because they saw, how they, they saw how they tormented Jesus. And they knew that they were walking with Jesus. So now maybe they're going to come after us. So they got a whole lot of emotions rolled up into one here. They're walking on the road because they don't really know what to make of this. This Jesus came, then he's gone. And now we're hearing people all over the city talking about they saw Jesus walking. They saw Jesus here and there. How can this be? So the scripture says, in verse 15, suddenly, come on, say suddenly, Jesus himself came along and joined them and began walking beside them, but they didn't know who he was because God kept them from recognizing him. You seem to be in a deep discussion about something, he said. What are you so concerned about? They stopped short, sadness written across their faces. Then Cleopas said, you must be the only person in Jerusalem who hasn't heard about all these things that have happened here in the last few days. What things, Jesus asked. The things that happened to Jesus, the man from Nazareth, they said. He was a prophet who did wonderful miracles. He was a mighty teacher, highly regarded by both God and all the people. But our leading priests and other religious leaders arrested him, handed him over to be condemned to death, and they crucified him. We had thought he was the Messiah who had come to rescue Israel. That all happened three days ago. Then some women were at the tomb early this morning and came back with an amazing report. They said his body was missing and they had angels who told them Jesus is alive. Some of our men ran out to see and sure enough, Jesus' body was gone, just as the women had said. Then Jesus said, you're so foolish people. You find it so hard to believe all the prophets written in the scriptures. Wasn't it clearly predicted by the prophets that the Messiah would have to suffer all these things before entering his time of glory? Then Jesus quoted passages from the writings of Moses and all the prophets, explaining what all the scriptures said about himself. By this time, they were nearing Emmaus. And at the end of their journey, Jesus would have gone on. But they begged him to stay the night with them since it was getting late. See, they didn't understand what was going on, but Jesus was going to keep on moving. That's why you got to pray, Lord, give me illumination. The Bible says, so he went home with them. And as they sat down to eat, he took a small loaf of bread, asked God's blessing on it, broke it, and gave it to them. It was a flashback of the Last Supper. Verse 31 says, then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him and he disappeared from their sight. My sister, my brother, we need illumination. That no matter what grief is coming to your life, no matter how much pain you are experiencing, no matter how much turmoil is around you or confusion, no matter how uncertain you are today, know that Jesus is with you. Know that he will never leave you nor forsake you. Know that he is your friend. Know that he's present to help you. He didn't come to condemn the world, but he came to save the world. He didn't come to cast you 
out, but he came that you might have life and have it to the full. Do you understand why we need illumination? Without illumination, we'll stay dead like the world, unsure and unclear. But if we will invite Holy Spirit, that we'll open the Bible and we'll begin to read, saying, Holy Spirit, speak to me so I understand. Holy Spirit, reveal to me even now. Holy Spirit, open the eyes of my understanding. Let me be spiritually discerned so that there's nothing that comes against me that I fall to, that there's nothing that attacks me that I give way to, but I trust you in all things because I see the character of who you are in the word, because I see the personality of who you are, because I know you're the same yesterday, today, and forever. I read it in your word, oh God. I cry out to you that you would open my eyes that I may see. If this is the cry of your heart, will you stand to your feet and let's just worship the Lord with gladness in our heart. Pastor is going to come shortly, but just take a moment to let's say, open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Come on, say, open the eyes of my heart. Everybody say, open the eyes. Open the eyes. Of my heart, oh God. Yeah. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Come on, sing it from your heart. Open the eyes of my heart. We sing it to you, Jesus. I want to see you. I want to see you. I want to see you. Open my eyes. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I, I want, want to, to see, see to see you high and lifted up, to, to see you high and lifted up, shining, shining in the light of your glory. Pour out your power and love as we sing holy, 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 holy. I want to. I want to see you. Amen. You may be seated. We need God to open our eyes as we read the Word of God. But if we're going to receive the benefits of, of God opening our eyes, it requires that we do some things. And if you have your, your, your notes with you, I've got five quick points I want to give you. Because everything that Pastor Quinn talked about about seeing the barriers, about knowing that I have a defense for what's attacking me, about seeing the solution to my problems, all of those things, about being able to see Jesus being with me in the midst of my situation, I'll never see any of that if I don't first begin a relationship with Jesus. I'm blind without Jesus. Without coming to know who God is through Jesus Christ, I'm spiritually blind. 1 Corinthians 2.14 says, The man without the Spirit does not accept the things that come from the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, and he cannot understand them because they are spiritually discerned. There are people around us who, if you have never accepted Jesus, if you've never given your heart to God, become a part of God's family, you're blinded. You can't even see the goodness of God. You can't even see that even in your worst moment, even in your darkest hour, you were not alone. Not because God wasn't there, but because you were blinded and you couldn't even see him. 2 Corinthians 4, 4 lets us know who blinds us. It says, the devil who rules this world has blinded the minds of those who do not believe. They can not see the light of the good news. So many people are going around in darkness. They're going around groping, trying to find a solution to life. But without that principal decision of coming to know Jesus, they'll continue to stay in darkness. But thank God, God made a way for us to get into his family. And John 3, 3 lets us know, Jesus declared, I tell you the truth, no one can see the kingdom of God unless he's born again. And some of you here under the sound of my voice, you've never made that quality decision for your life. You've heard about God. You've been around people who know and love God. But you yourself have not made that decision for your life. 
At the end of this lesson, we're going to give you an opportunity to begin a relationship with Jesus Christ. Because you cannot fully know God without coming to know him through Jesus Christ. The second thing we have to do is we have to ask God in faith to open our eyes. As you go to the Bible, now that you are in the family of God, you simply have to ask God to show you what he's trying to say to you. Ask God in faith to open my eyes. Now, our, our memory verse this week, it was Psalm 119, 18. Now, I was embarrassed at the 8 o'clock service because I asked everybody to say it, and there was a whole lot of mumbling. Praise the Lord. So it's up on the screen, Psalm 119, 18. Let's read it together. Open my eyes that I may see wonderful things in your law. That ought to be our prayer as we approach God's word. God, open my eyes so that I can see wonderful things in your law. I'm not reading the Bible so I can be beat up and feel condemned and feel bad about what's not right in my life. I'm going to God's word because I want to see wonderful things. I want to see, God, what you're saying to me in my situation today. And James 1, 5, and 6 lets us know any of, if any of you lacks wisdom, all you have to do is just ask. Wow. God is so loving to us. He didn't say if you want wisdom, fast for 40 days. He didn't say go feed the whole world and then I'll give you wisdom. He said if you want wisdom, ask. And you know what? If you want to be in God's family, all you have to do is ask. There's nothing that you lack or desire that God doesn't want to give to you. And the wonderful thing is, before you ask, he's already made provision for it. But what triggers it to come towards us is by us asking. Matthew 7, 7 says, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the, the door will be open. God is waiting for us. He gave you the answers to whatever was happening in your life before you even showed up in the Bible. All we have to do is just read it and let him speak to us from his word. And as he speaks to us, we'll find all the solutions that we need. And then Psalm 32, 8 lets us know, I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will counsel you and watch over you. God wants to be our teacher. He wants to be the one who guides us. He wants to be the one that shows us the way. But we have to let him. We have to let him guide us. We have to let him show us the way. Give him a chance to be God. In addition to asking God in faith to open my eyes, point number three is I have to come with a humble attitude. I find it amazing how many people really feel like they know as much as God knows. And so when we read the Bible, many of us, we read the Bible from a perspective of, I want to refute what I'm reading. But none of us is really competent or qualified to refute what the Bible says because the one who authored it is the one who created the world. And since none of us has ever created a world, we really are not qualified to critique the one who wrote the, the instruction manual. So that requires that we be teachable. Yeah, yeah. When I approach the word of God, I, I'm, I'm saying, God, show me something, teach me something, not about someone else. Right. Teach me something that helps me. Yeah. Psalm 25, 9 said, he guides the humble in what is right and teaches them his way. How teachable are you? How willing are you to be instructed? And this is a scripture we all know, Proverbs 3, 5 to 6. It says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will make your path straight. If we just trust God, he'll take us through whatever we're going through. Number four. 
if I'm going to walk in this illumination, if I'm going to get all of, out of God's word all that he has for me, it also requires that I cleanse my heart of sin and conflict. Yes, our sinful behavior does block what God wants to do for us. Yes, our conflict with other people keeps us from receiving the best that God has for us. And this then requires us to stop and look at how we live our lives. Are we always upset with somebody? Are we always in a disagreement with somebody? Is there always somebody that we're just not getting along with? Well, we may need to stop and check ourselves. Because we'll never get the best that God has for us if we're always in conflict. Amen? So Matthew 5, 8, Jesus taught us that blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Many of us can't see God because our hearts are so corrupted. Corrupted with bitterness, unforgiveness, anger, wrath, disappointment, loss. All of those things pollute our lives. Some of us are just right out sinning. We know what we're doing is not right. And we're not even trying to stop. That cuts us off. That keeps us from seeing what God wants us to see. It keeps us blinded to, to seeing the help that God has already offered us in our situation. And many of us keep stay in our situations too long because we cannot see God's way of escape. Every challenge we face, God has already made a way for us to get out. When we were going through the permitting process for this building, one of the things that they required was that we be able to show people how to get out if there were an emergency. Well, it's not just the building department that does that. God did it first. God requires that there's no situation that we ever will face that he has not already said, this is the way out. But if we are not seeing, if our eyes are not open, we'll stay in the situation and not get out the way God wants us to. So is there sin, is there conflict in your heart? Make a decision today. I'm letting it all go because I want to see all that God has for me. And then number five, I must commit in advance to do what God says. Now this is vital because if we approach God's word from a negotiating standpoint, when we read something in the Bible that challenges us, and we immediately start to say, well, God, I know your word says this, but how about this? You know, kind of, let's make a deal. I know, God, you, you want me to love my enemies, but can I just get them back one good time and then I'll be okay? I know you want me to forgive people, but God, can I just forgive people who don't wound me too deeply? When we approach God's word, our first position must be that I'm going to obey whatever I read. Because if God knows we're going to ignore what he says, do you think he's going to keep talking? Think of it this way. You ever um, tried to, uh, somebody come to you and say, hey, listen, I have a question. Can you help me? And you say, sure, let me help you. And as soon as you start talking to them, they say, I know, I know, I know. I know, when we used to get lost in the early days, amen, and you know, we had the GPS, but I knew I was smarter than the GPS. I know, I got it, I know, I got it. And while we're rolling around and around and around in circles, and Pastor Quinn's just looking at me like, we have to commit up front. God. If this is what you want me to do, this is what I'm going to do. 
You know, you ever put together a toy? And you know, when you get these toys, they look so simple. And they give you this 10-page instruction sheet. Well, you know, I fashion myself as a pretty smart guy, so, you know, I see the parts. It seems pretty simple, so what do I need these instructions for? Let me just put it together. And I put it together, and then when I look at it, it looks nice, but I see all these extra parts. <laughs> now, I begin to think, these, these people are very wasteful. <laughs> Why would they manufacture these toys and put all these extra parts in? That's why they charge us so much money, because they're wasting all these extra parts that we don't even need. And then when the toy is being played with, <laughs> miraculously it falls apart. <laughs> because those parts that I left out were needed. Well, let's apply that to our lives. Many of our lives are falling apart because we've left out some parts from the instruction manual. There's nothing you face that God hasn't already shown you, here's how I want you to do it. And if we say to God, I know that's what it says, but I think I, got, I, think I have a better way to handle it. Every time we do that, it falls apart. And you know what happens when it falls apart? We've got to go right back to the instruction manual and figure out where we missed it. So let's save ourselves a step. Rather than going back to the instruction manual after the toy has fallen apart, our lives have fallen apart, let's start with it. Let's say, God, how am I supposed to be the person you've called me to be? How am I supposed to be the employee on my job that you want me to be? How am I supposed to be the husband, the wife, the friend? How am I supposed to be the believer you want me to be? How am I supposed to interact with people? How am I supposed to manage my time, my finances? My how am I supposed to do all of this? And God says, I've given you all the answers right in the Word. So let me give you our last two scriptures. Psalm 119, 33 says, Teach me, O Lord, to follow your decrees. Then I will keep them to the end. Give me understanding, and I will keep your law and obey it with all my heart. We're not trying to just learn a whole bunch of scripture during our 40 days in the Word. It means nothing just to know a bunch of scripture. Because we know a bunch of scripture. The issue is not, do we know Scripture? The issue is, are we doing it? <laughs> and so our memory verse for this week, James chapter 1, verse 22, do not merely listen to the Word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Come on, let's say it together. Do not merely listen to the Word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Your heads are bowed and your eyes are closed. Father, we recognize your word is life. And so today, we examine ourselves and we realize that we cannot